today. This conference um, will now be recorded. As Sarah said, the, the topic we're covering today, the theme, is celebrating winter to spring in the northeastern Minnesota region. And I'm a part of the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center in Duluth, Minnesota, a part of the Detroit district. So again, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. It's very exciting to be presenting again. It's been a while since I've presented. I've been more behind the scenes. Um, but just a, a reminder, this is a highly interactive program. So we're going to be util utilizing that chat feature quite a bit. So in the beginning, it's that icon, that bubble icon in the top right corner. Uh, so get that ready. I'll, I'll prompt you before we actually get the question portions going. But again, I'd love your participation throughout the program. And uh, mute your mic and your video if you haven't already, just so that everybody can view uh, the program in a nice way. All right, so what are we covering today? Um, this is just an overview of what we're gonna be covering. So why do the ch seasons change in the first place? Uh, what is climate versus weather? What's phenology and what does that mean? And what's the history behind it? Uh, what are the signs of the season changing? And we're gonna be covering three different uh, subtopics within that. So weather, animals, and then trees, plants, and shrubs, and some signs you can look out for within this region and this area. And why is this important? Uh, why does this vary for region to region? And, and why should we pay attention in the first place? So who am I? Uh, what makes me qualified to talk about this? Well, uh, my name is Trisha Bartles. I'm the assistant director here at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center. And I have a master's degree in environmental education. So I specialize a lot in the naturey stuff. And I love teaching people about the great outdoors. Um, so to cover this, it's an exciting topic for me. And it's also something that adheres to Earth Month. Uh, so uh, being April, we have Earth Day coming up. I think it's on the 21st or the 22nd of this year. Uh, since we're just starting out April, I don't know myself. But um, just kind of putting something a little more natural history focused. So you're probably also wondering, what does this have to do with boats and how does this tie back to our normal programming? Um, so phenology, and I'll cover the definition in a moment, adheres a lot to the changing of the seasons. And sometimes that means things like uh, higher water levels or gale warnings or winds that can affect our boats coming from one side of the lake to the other. So it does uh, play back into the other aspect of the shipping industry. Sometimes this can delay our boats, sometimes they can anchor out. And sometimes it can affect the work that we do here with USAC and the Army Corps and our dredging projects, being able to put that sediment or that sand in different places to make sure that the harbors are operating as they should. So natural history has a good relationship with the actual history of the uh, maritime industry. So just kind of tying that back into perspective that it's all connected. Um, so I'm going to shout, shout this back at you, so get those chat functions ready. But I wanted to see where we're at and what you think of this question. So why is it important to pay attention to the changing of the seasons? Go ahead and answer that question in chat. Why is it important to pay attention to the changing of seasons? Uh, so I see start recognizing patterns of change. Sure, absolutely. Uh, mentally prepare for the temperature feel. Yep. <laughs> Understand the world we're living in. Yeah, and paying attention to those signs uh, to adhere to, you know, maybe spring is actually coming, right? Uh, yeah, knowing what to wear, super important. I have a phrase that I say often, um, and it's, there's no bad weather, there's only bad gear. So there's always something that you can wear in any climate. Do I need sunscreen? Yes. Uh, also very important, you should apparently be wearing that every day, even in the winter. So that's a good thing to have it on hand at all times. Awesome. Uh, and then let's see. Yep, that's all of them. Awesome. So thank you for, for the participation. I really appreciate it. We're going to continue like this as we go. So this isn't a chat question, this is just a rhetorical question, but what causes the changing of the seasons? Um, and we're gonna go back a little bit to like that fifth or sixth grade when you started talking about, you know, the Earth's access and all that, because I think people kind of forget this as life goes on. So according to NASA, it's the Earth's access, right? And to show this little graphic that NASA has provided, it's got a lot of words on it, but I'm gonna synopsis it for you a little bit here. The Earth's axis is tilted, and I think we always forget that because we rotate the sun, you know, in this cyclical pattern, but we're also tilted when that's happening. So to give, put us into perspective for the northern hemisphere, which is us, if you've forgotten, <laughs> uh, when the north pole tw tilts toward the sun, it's summer in the northern hemisphere, and then it's 
the opposite in the South Pole. So when the South Pole is tilted towards the sun, it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. So with that rotation and that tilt, that's how we form our seasons as we're going around the sun each year. And I always want to point out too that the Earth's axis always points in the same direction as it's rotating and as it's rotating uh, around the sun. So it never like changes its axis tilt. So another thing that I like to point out to people that I also <laughs> learned a couple of years because I was like, yeah, what is it? wait, what is the difference? Um, is what is the difference between climate and weather? So go ahead and and try and define either one or both in the chat. I'll give you a moment to type that out. But like, what is the difference between climate and weather? I'll put this little thing up here to give you a, a little hint. Weather is daily, climate is over time. Yep. And is that referring to the climate over time, like the weather that's there? Or how would you say over time? Patterns of weather, sure. Um, so I'll give you the actual definitions if we're going to compare them. Here's some reference images. So since it's wit winter here in the Midwest, I wanted to give us something warmer to look at and something drier. Um, so I'm deciding to go with uh, the desert for this example. So this is a lovely desert, high desert, red rocks uh, landscape for you to check out. But climate is the weather conditions prevailing in a long period. So if we're looking at desert, that's what's typical in that area which creates that climate. Our climate here, obviously, in Minnesota is more boreal type focused, um, and the lake affects that too. So we expect all four seasons. Whereas in the desert, they don't necessarily get that. They get like a winter and a summer, and some a little bit of spring with the cacti blooming down there, but less of a dramatic change as the Midwest. So comparing it to weather, Weather is the state of the atmosphere with respect to wind, temperature, cloudiness, moisture, and pressure. So when people think about weather, I think we often think about, oh, is it going to rain? Is it going to be sunny? Is it going to be cloudy? But we also have to put respect into uh, wind or um, moisture or pressure because that obviously affects the weather systems and what weather systems are flowing throughout the United States to affect one another as it, as it goes past the west coast to the east. So it's just a little refresher here because I referenced this a little bit later, but just to give us a, a basic understanding of why the seasons change. And then I put it out at the bottom. Um, the climate takes longer to change over time. So a climate could change over time and become, you know, let's say the desert could become winter <laughs> over time um, with the changing of the seasons. And this has to do with phenology as well. So what is phenology? What's the backbone of that? Uh, phenology's definition is pretty simple, and it's kind of funny because it's also vague. Um, so phenomena plus lology. <laughs> uh, it's a science between dealing with the relations between climate, periodic bi biological phenomena such as bird migration and plant flowering. And you're so still probably like, well, what does that actually mean? Uh, it's the silence of dealing with the, si the, the signs of the seasons changing, and that's accompanied with climates not necessarily weather, because weather isn't something as stable, although it is documented on a daily basis. But to give you a little background on how did phenology come to be, and, and what is this study, and how did it start? And it actually started here in the Midwest. For as long as humans can remember, we have been studying the seasonal changes. Phenologists observe and document these events to discover nature's patterns. Aldo Leopold, the guy you see here on the left, uh, an ecologist and wildlife conserver, began keeping records in 1930 on his Wisconsin farm to document changes. His daughter, Nina, um, continued this documentation until she passed in 2011. Today, this helps scientists, natural resource specialists, and observers document these climate changes and variations in pattern. For example, in Lake Superior, we document changes of ice, lake levels, bird migration, and boat numbers. <laughs> These numbers help document and show what changes from year to year within our usual patterns. So there's like lake levels as well. And then bird migration. So I wanted to read you a couple quotes too that were by Aldo Leopold to kind of give it into perspective as to why he's motivated by this work as an ecologist and also a phenologist. Harmony with land is like harmony with a friend. You cannot cherish his right hand and chop off his left. That is to say, you cannot love game and hate predators. The land is one organism. 
Another good one is, no matter how intently one studies the hundred little dramas of the woods and meadows, one can never learn all the salient facts about any of them. So there's always more research to be done. There's always more things to document. And I think this is looking out at, it's either the St. Louis River or the Boundary Waters. I'm not sure exactly where this is taken, but this is obviously in the northeastern Minnesota region. And the point is, is that you can document this by yourself at home, and it can be on a small scale or a large scale. Any impact will, will lead to showing why this all matters. So I have another question for you. What is the definition of phonology again? And how does this happen near you? So what does phonology mean? And what are some things that you can maybe see in your region that show phonology? Documentary changes in nature on a daily basis, sure. Mm -hmm. One of those is, yep, bird migration, very good. Are there other smaller scale um, phenomena that can happen as well? Yeah, leaf color changing, that's kind of where my head was going at, so you're kind of reading my mind there, Sarah. But um, yeah, that's something that happens every year that we often look forward to that's on a smaller scale as well. Awesome. Uh, so just to reiterate that definition, it's a science dealing with the relations between climate and periodic biological phenomena, like bird migration. Awesome. Bears, yeah, bears is a good one too. All right, so this is, I'm gonna do these throughout the program as well, but are there any questions thus far that I can answer for you before we move on? And don't worry. Cat yet, but we'll wait a second and see if anyone has any. Okay, sounds good. And I'm super patient. I'll sit here for a minute. <laughs> I think we're prob probably good to move on. Okay, sounds okay. good. Uh, so the next thing we're going to cover, the question that I'm posing to everyone, is what is the phenology in northeastern Minnesota? So we're going to actually start learning how to identify this. Now, I should point out that there are many signs that I'm not covering. Um, there's plenty of details that you can look for that are way more specific, to, especially to your region. I'm just going to give a breath overview of what are some typical signs you can see. So we're going to start with winter, um, which is everybody's favorite season here in Minnesota. Um, and we're going to cover this in two months increments. So I'm going to cover January to February and those signs bulk together because, because sometimes they vary from year to year, but overall you'll see this typically in January, February. Likewise, for the spring portion, we'll cover March and April to kind of show what could happen around those months to show signs of spring. So starting with winter, we're going to start with the first category, which is weather. And one of the best signs to show that it's winter <laughs> is it's really cold out here. <laughs> So sometimes this is like the polar vortex, which is something that you're seeing in this image here, like lots of negative temperatures throughout the state. Another thing, a huge indicator is snow. And these are the obvious ones. So I'm starting off easy here for you. But we get a lot of snow here in Minnesota, especially in the northern regions. And this is very typical from year to year in our climate. Another cool thing that's, um, I would say, that phenomena aspect or something that's kind of cool to know about northern, northeastern Minnesota so there's this thing called wild ice, and it appeared this year, but it's four inches of um, ice thickness that you can ice skate on. And sometimes it's kind of sketchy because you can you can ice skate on it, but you can hear the, the ice cracking. So this is something where you should, you know, have your safety gear with you or have a buddy and be sure to be safe about it. But it's a really cool phenomenon that's local to us here. Another thing that's local on Lake Superior in general and in the colder aspects of it is sea smoke. Um, and what that means is the lake temperature is warmer than the air. So it's creating this um, vapor, water vapor, that's kind of like cloud-like and it rolls over the lake. And it's super pretty to see. Um, this is a picture snippet of when I saw it on a sunrise. So to give you a little synopsis, some examples are cold temps, more snow, polar vortex. Another thing that I didn't mention is dry air. It's really dry out. Good indicator that it's right in the depths of winter. 
All right, so covering animals. Uh, someone mentioned this earlier, but yes, bears are in hibernation right now, and they are in their bear dens. And what they're actually doing around this time of the year in January, February, is they're actually giving birth to a bear cub while they're still in hibernation. So how crazy is that? We've got a hibernating mama, and she's just giving birth without even knowing it. <laughs> Another thing to look for is deer antlers that shed around this time of year. So this is where people sometimes collect them in the forest if they're able to find them. And this is because of a drop in testosterone rates in male bucks. Um, and they, because of that drop in testosterone, they shed it once a year and then regrow it again. Uh, you will see little critters like a gray squirrel probably come out about once a week. So you're gonna see them less frequently because they're scavenging for whatever they can find and then going back into their holes and kind of preserving their energy. Another thing is you'll hear um, this time of year, and this is also a sure sign of spring, so this is something that you'll see in both winter and spring in Minnesota. But the black-capped chickadee, uh, you'll be able to hear this call in the winter. They're one of the few birds that stick around. They're a very interesting bird. Um, they also can be carnivorous if they can't find anything else, so sometimes they will eat dead carcasses, um, <laughs> which is what you wouldn't expect out of that sweet little bird. Um, another thing to point out is we actually have two uh, types of gulls in Minnesota. There's the ring-billed, which is the one in the middle, and then the herring, which is the one on the right, and the herring is the larger one. But these are actually native to Minnesota and they never leave. <laughs> People think they, fly, they should fly south for the winter, but they actually are native here um, and end up staying throughout the duration of the year. And there's a little synopsis for you of what to look out for. Um, something that I didn't mention is owls, like great gray and snowy owls come around and they uh, migrate here in the winter time. So that's something really cool to look for. And then I have a black capped chickadee call. Now we tried to work this earlier on PowerPoint and it ended up being really quiet. So I'm gonna actually put it to my mic from my phone. But there's two types of calls. Um, we're only gonna hear one of them and I'll tell you what it is after we listen to it. So what you just heard is what the black cap chickadee's name comes from. So it's chickadee and that call is the DDD call. So they go chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. And the number of DDs that you hear is actually their alert level of the, the level of threat that they're communicating to one another. So the higher level of Ds, let's say it's a five star D, they're like, wow, there's a dog in the vicinity. They will tell the other chickadees, oh, chickadee dee 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 dee. <laughs> it's kind of like their panic mode. Another one you'll typically hear is the male's uh, song, and that one is, hey, sweetie, or cheeseburger, <laughs> and that's something that you'll hear probably more often than the DD one, um, but that those are two indicators of being able to identify that the bird is in the area for you as well. So moving on to trees, plants, and shrubs. Very wide category here, but I'm gonna give you a small synopsis. So there's this cool little diagram to show you um, I want to point out two things here, and let's see if I can get my laser pointer. There it is. So it's this terminal bud at the top here. This is typically at the end of something like a tree. You know, this is where the leaves come from for the tree. Another thing that they can come from is an auxiliary or a lateral bud, which is next to that terminal bud. What's really cool about these is that points out new growth for each year that happens. Sometimes these will be shorter apart, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll turn into a scar because they had a bad year. Um, so it's kind of a cool indicator to see how the trees are doing in your area. Now these terminal buds will not be present. Um, they won't be, they will be there, but your, your trees are in hibernation mode. So they're spreading out their sugars um, throughout the interior. I think it's called the phloem of the tree. And they're trying to preserve and spread out those cells so that they don't freeze. And they do that for the duration of winter. So with the terminal bud, that means that that terminal bud isn't gonna bloom yet. It's just gonna remain as this little nub at the end. So that's something to look out for. The trees will give you a good indicator of when spring is close. Another thing to point out with things like plants or shrubs um, is there's dormancy or death <laughs> that's happening. And dormancy is basically what this chart is showing that throughout the year, um, in summertime, they bloom their fruits or their flowers, you know, they get pollinated, that sort of thing. Um, and then they have a growth cessation. So they're starting to stop growing. Then they proceed into winter and have, you know, like those winter buds, their terminal or uh, lateral buds appearing. 
that sort of thing. So the dormancy will appear year after year. You'll see the same plants pop up again, kind of like your grass in your backyard. Death and the way that works is plants will die, you know, an annual plant will die, um, but it'll emit its seeds and the next year a new growth will show up. So that's just a, a couple little things to be able to know that it's winter and or, you know, to see where you're at and approaching spring. So spring, something we are all looking forward to. I'm going to move my laser pointer out of the way. Um, so we're going to start again with the same categories showing signs of spring, which is what we're looking for right now. Uh, in March and April, we're looking at different weather patterns. So we're going to see some of that, uh, that ice and that runoff start to melt. We're going to see the ice break up on the lake, see less of the sea smoke type thing. By the way, that's a cam for uh, the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center, the boat that just went through the Polar Tour that just went through that canal, so that's kind of cool. And again, the ice breaking up. Um, you'll start to see things like muddier trails, uh, patches of grass trying to grow, more runoff in the watershed. Um, so in cer certain areas of Duluth, we have a pretty hilly area. And if a you know pond that's higher up on the hill, that'll eventually start melting, that watershed will start flowing a lot more. So in spring, that's when you get the best waterfalls. If you've ever heard of Gooseberry Falls, um, that's something that is worth visiting in the spring because it'll have the most amount of water, water flow. So again, those, those signs, no more sea smoke, <laughs> which is quite a bummer. And then getting into animals. Um, so that black bear we talked about earlier that had the cubs in her den, she is now coming out and she is thin and hungry. So she's gonna start looking for food. Um, this is typically when you may see them starting to get into your garbage or you know being in your neighborhood as well because they're starting to look for whatever's available. Bird migration starts, which is super cool here. Um, there are thermals on this part of Lake Superior that the birds ride on on the lake, and that's why the bird migration can kind of hollows through Duluth. So this is a great time to view the birds if you're interested in bird counting or bird identifying. Another fun one that you know we don't look forward to as much here in the Midwest, but mosquitoes <laughs> start to appear. Um, our critters start coming out a little more frequently. Uh, black flies on the shores of Lake Superior start to hatch, so they're going to start appearing here soon, or in the Boundary Waters as well. And then the wood tick and the deer tick start appearing as well. They burrow underground and start emerging as tiny little uh, seedlings, per se, in the springtime. So this is a good time to be a little tick conscious as well. And there's a little synopsis again for you. Trees, plants, and shrubs in March and April. So again, I mentioned earlier talking about the terminal buds, um, but now sap is starting to flow from those trees. So they are going to uh, start warming up and the trees are starting to get their sugars flowing. So this is a great time to start pulling sap from maple trees. And the terminal buds that I was referring to earlier, so before they were a little hard, um, they weren't blooming yet. They may start changing to a greenish color. They kind of have a sticky texture as well, so if you touch them, so that's a good indicator that they're starting to potentially bloom soon. And that's just really kind of cool to see as you look up at um, different trees. You can sometimes kind of see them in the visual against skyline. Grass is growing. If you like cutting grass, this is a great time to look forward to that. Um, and then there's a rain season, so we'll see a lot more rain flow, a lot more fog in the area, and a lot more pooling of that water. And I also should point out that flowering plants probably won't start till May or June just because winter is so long here in the Midwest. All right, so now it's your turn. This is where we're going to put those skills to the test. Let's identify the signs. We're going to start with each of those categories that we just covered. I'm going to show you a photo, and I'd like for, in total, we can hopefully get two signs identified to show the signs of each category. So we're going to start with January and February and covering weather. What are two signs in these photos that it is January or February in the weather category here in northeastern Minnesota? Nice, Scott. Yeah, sea smoke, snow. Super easy category here. <laughs> are there any other ones that we can see in these photos?
Black leaves, yep, that is one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes oak leaves on trees, you'll see they're like turn oranges in the winter. They attach though, so don't be fooled by that. <laughs> That's not an indication that it's still fall. Um, but sometimes you'll see an oak leaf have its leaves still attached, so it's kind of cool to be able to identify that tree right away based on it holding on to its leaves. Um, ice, yeah, there is ice formation on this lake. You can see uh, kind of in this area, this is where the actual ice sheet is, and then this is Lake Superior and the water flowing. So that's also a great indicator. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's it from for here. Awesome, nice work. So we're gonna do it again with animals in January and February. Bonus points, if you can identify this bird and what its name is. Black cap chickadee, A plus, Scott. Um, yes, that is correct. And it's got that DDD call or the cheeseburger. So if you hear that, you probably will if you go on a walk anywhere. Um, they're pretty common in, throughout Minnesota. Does anybody know what happens with the deers as well? I mentioned something that happens to the male bucks in winter time. Yes, they shed the antlers. Awesome. Very good. Um, yeah, and you'll see the black cap chickadee be a little more frequent. Um, other things that happen around this time is that's when black bear cubs are born as well. All right, so identifying the signs, trees, plants, and shrubs in January and February. I apologize for the blurriness of this picture. It is from my phone, and this is one of the best references I could find. Um, but what are, a little more challenging here, but what are two things that show that it's winter for the ple for the plants, shrubs, and trees. Think back to that diagram I showed you and I talked about two different things that are a sign that are a little smaller scale that this picture can't show. Yes, that is one. Uh, some plants are in dormancy or they're in the dust stage, yes. So the other thing to reiterate is the terminal buds. So you can pick up um, any of the trees, like the smaller oak trees that are kind of in this area. You could go ahead and take the end of it and look at that terminal bud and see where it's at to make sure that we're still in the depths of winter. Again, it'll be kind of harder. It won't be squishy. It won't have any, gr any green color to it or anything like that. That's a good indicator that we are in the depths of winter. Awesome. All right, so identifying the, sh the signs, we're moving on to spring. Um, which are some signs that we should be seeing right now. So this is the weather in spring. What are two signs here that you see? Yes, there is definitely some mud um, forming. There's the leaves here too are starting to disintegrate. That's a good um, indicator that, you know, we just got out of winter. Uh, yes, the ice is melting. Um, deers change their coat color. Yes, that is correct. Yep, so some of the grass is like turning like a greenish color and maybe it'll start popping up. Um, on the trees up here, you can maybe see, this might be from last winter, but sometimes they might start showing um, some of their seeds right away as well, depending on the species. Awesome. All right, moving along to animals. Um, now this is kind of tricky, and I'm kind of doing this on purpose, but what are some signs that there are animals in spring? Or what, I should rephrase that question. What are some signs that it is spring in the animal category? And what are we looking at here too? There are kind of tracks in this photo. Um, someone asked if they saw tracks. 
kind of. We're looking more at the things in the middle, like the little white thing here, and then what is this thing? <laughs> and what does that mean? What is the indication here? Uh, shedding. I wouldn't say that there's shedding in spring. Uh, it's something that happens with fall, like with your dog. Um, but the bigger hint, maybe to tie these two together, is this thing here. Anyone got a shot? Otherwise, I'm going to reveal it. <laughs> yes, Sarah's got it. So this is, um, not to be morbid, uh, but it is a deer hoof. So this is like the shin of the deer, and you can kind of see the deer hoof here. So this is a deer leg, um, and this is actually the fur of the deer. So something I mentioned earlier was that black bear is coming out, and really hungry after hibernation. Well, actually, when, when I was on this trail, I took these photos. Um, it was up near Split Rock, and I was hiking with my husband, and there were these signs, and it's an indicator. We ended up finding tracks of a wolf pack. So a wolf pack was hunting along this trail, and they ended up putting different parts of you know, the deer spreadings uh, throughout the trail. So a big indicator that wasn't covered, and that's why I said it's kind of tricky, is that animals would start actively hunting again just because there is more presence of those um, prey. So some of the deer are coming out of their like nesting sites and they're actually getting more out to get the food as well, which in, in essence also brings wolves to get out and hunt them. Um, and then some of the indicators that we kind of talked about earlier, um, bird migration is starting. Uh, you'll see squirrels and rabbits a little bit more, ticks and black flies and mosquitoes. So there's are some other indications that spring is on its way. All right, last category here, uh, March and April trees, plants, and shrubs. What's happening in these photos? What are two signs that it is becoming spring according to the plants? Trees are budding, and this is kind of hard to see. Again, these are like cell phone photos, so I apologize for them being kind of pixelated. But so these are quaking aspen. You'll see these a lot, and sometimes they look like, um, I'm not trying to think of birch. They look like birch trees. But these are quaking aspen, and up here you can kind of see the coloration, especially against the blue, that there is some budding, um, and it looks kind of like reddish. But yeah, the leaves are starting to show up on these quaking aspen. Another reason is you'll start to see these saplings. Uh, they might not necessarily be this tall the first time you see them, but paying attention to the ground and looking at um, that saplings are emerging as well as the, the leaves are starting to decay. Um, and then to reiterate that you can look at the terminal and lateral buds on the edge of a tree and it'll be a little more squishy and a little more textured. Um, so that's a big sign that trees are starting to get ready to bloom. They're saying, hey, it's warm enough to let our sap flow and let our sugar show up. All right, another questions portion before we move on. I don't see any questions coming through the chat. All right, sounds good. So this kind of brings it up to, you know, why is this important? Why do we need to know these signs and what do they have to do with my area and why should I pay attention? So according to the National Phenology Network, phenology influences the abundance and distribution of organisms, ecosystem services, food webs, and global cycles of water and carbon. In turn, phenology may be altered by changes in temperature and precipitation. So these are the main points here. The first one is to start off with the management of invasive species and forest pests. So if we had longer summers in Minnesota, um, we would probably have a bigger tick problem, a bigger mosquito problem, and that would in turn throw off the ecosystem um, 
for let's say the inconvenience of humans because we don't necessarily like those pests um, but let's say bats because bats may be able to reproduce more and that population could get out of hand things like that just to get the idea that if things are not in balance um, certain species may end up blowing up more than they should predictions of uh, human health related events such as allergies and mosquito season i briefly mentioned mosquito season but allergies are a big thing that also can affect humans Optimization of when to plant, fertilize, and harvest crops. So this is a big one too. If we had a much longer winter, um, some of our crops might not show up or we wouldn't have enough time to get some of those crops to actually show up um, in spring as they should to be able to harvest in the late summer or fall. So that can also affect our food production. Understanding the timing of ecosystem processes such as carbon cycling. What is carbon cycling? Carbon cycling is basically like when you put CO2 into the atmosphere, how does it either A, get rid of itself by the time it hits the atmosphere or how does it affect the atmosphere? Um, so that's also like, we can't all obviously drive our cars, you know, 24 hours a day because that would offset the carbon cycling process. And the assessment of vulnerability, <clears throat> excuse me, of species populations and e ecological communities on ongoing to climate change. So this is probably the biggest reason is to show indications of climate change so that we can act accordingly to help with that balance. Um, and this would affect the shipping industry in, I think, the most uh, frequent way of like actual storms or water levels or things like that. That would be the direct way that um, the shipping industry would be affected. So how does phenology vary from region to region? Um, well, in the northeastern Minnesota region, there are things that we can expect to rely on. We know that the winters are, are long. We know that we have four seasons, which sometimes feel more like three. <laughs> um, and we know that we can, you know, depend on Lake Superior for certain weather changes. Uh, a lot of the wind sometimes comes off the lake. It's cooler, um, which is nice in the summertime, but not so nice in the winter. We can rely on things like sea smoke appearing, uh, polar vortex, things like that. This obviously isn't the same if we go back to that desert example in, in talking about, okay, what is the climate there and how is the phenology different there? We wouldn't be able to expect winter there or sea smoke or things like that. So from region to region and climate to climate, these obviously will vary based on the small ecosystem that exists there. So now I'm gonna throw it back to you and, and give you some ideas of how you can study phenology near you because anyone can do this anywhere. And sometimes it could be for fun or sometimes it could be for things like citizen science or research. So to start off with uh, the first option, which is kind of a fun option, I think, um, is starting a phenology journal. And what this entails is like the date, the time, the weather, the same location in each entry. Um, you can sketch the area or have photos, and it's typically in the same area so that you can document the changes over time. I would say also that this is probably a daily thing, just so you can see all the small details over time. Think of like a fa farmer's almanac almost. Um, another thing is a plot study, and people are like, what is a plot study? It's when you stay in the same spot, so a very, like, I would say 10 by 10 foot radius um, for about an hour a week, preferably during a shoulder season, which is like right in the middle of two seasons and there's you know all these changes happening so that you can watch the transition. Again, you're gonna include the date, the time, the weather and the location. Um, and then sketches of the area or photos. I've done one of these and taken actual photos and trying to identify as many plants as possible just so we can document more changes. Yeah, like that. <laughs> All right, so the, another option is a nature journal, and this is a very pretty insert of a nature journal, um, but this is probably the most relaxed uh, type of option, and a lot of people like to do this as a hobby. So you can go to multiple spots and record what you see, what you hear, what you feel, um, based on your sense of touch, and date, and add the location. But this is really more about like sketching and finding the details in the organisms that you're looking at and being able to identify them. Everybody is an artist and you can sketch something into full detail um, just because it allows you to see more. So if you do a quick little, you know, like type of uh, a flower that's, you know, got all these petals and then you draw your stem right away. Obviously, that's not going to show you all the details, but it's kind of nice to take something and look at it in a very microscopic level just so you can get to know that aspect of nature a little bit more. Again, a challenge is to identify as many species as you can. 
and like I said, it's typically for pleasure. Another thing you can do is a uh, bird migration count. You can help volunteer and count birds in the shoulder seasons of spring or fall. Uh, this photo is from Hawk Ridge as well here in Duluth, Minnesota. It's one of the counting spots uh, that they utilize in the spring. So like I said, you can volunteer. Uh, it's a form of citizen science, which is where citizens document information and then report it to scientists to help them formulate research. So it's kind of cool because the average person can do this. You can do this with your family, you can do this with your grandchildren, you can do this on your own. It's just something that um, contributes to society and the phenology as a whole. This is a long link, um, but if anybody's interested, I could copy and paste it in the chat at the end. Um, this is to find out more about Hawk Ridge and their counting um, schedule and how you can volunteer. So you can contribute to citizen science anywhere. Um, and this photo is from Boulder Lake uh, Environmental Learning Center, which is about 30 minutes like west of Duluth. Right now for them, April is Citizen Science Month. So what a great time to do this presentation as well. Um, and citizen science, like I said, is where you help record data for scientists. Now they need help recording this month vernal pools, uh, toads and frogs, wood ducks, dragonflies, and more. So you get to look at one species and kind of document it um, to help them out with that research. And there's a link for that as well to find out more. And then to point out too that citizen science could be done throughout multiple uh, organizations throughout the US. I'll post a link at the end here so that you can copy and paste and that'll help you locate citizen science near you if you're curious about doing that as well. And for further research, uh, resources for learning, because um, who wouldn't want more learning, right? Um, the reference here at the top is the National Phenology Network that I used that quote earlier. Um, there's a cool little PDF here that summarizes the phenology in Minnesota by the DNR. This is to find citizen science near you, and this is to find out more about USACE, um, the Army Corps of Engineers, and what surveying and mapping we do, and what that looks like right now. And that is all I have for you folks. And I'm going to turn it over back to Sarah. She's got a couple things to cover, and then we'll get to the questions portion. So thank you. Thanks, Trisha. That was awesome. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> before we get to questions, I just want to uh, give you all an update on our our respective visitor centers. Okay, so for our location in Duluth, uh, we are currently doing, we have cell phone tours outside available to everyone. And we also have a virtual online tour of the museum. We are answering questions by phone and we're planning on having rangers outside to provide uh, visitor assistance during the week of April 19th. And we also have the online gift shop, which is marinemuseumgifts.com. And at the Sioux Locks Visitor Center in Sioux St. Marie, Michigan, the park and platform are both open from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. And they're working on plans to open in May, but uh, both there and our plans for opening are all uh, subject to uh, state and federal guidance and when local health conditions permit. So as things improve, Hopefully we will move towards uh, reopening. And and finally, just a reminder for next week pro next week's program. Uh, Mr. Mark Gill, who's the director of vessel traffic services on the St. Mary's River for the U.S. Coast Guard, will share the history behind the domestic icebreaking mission, the resources involved, and the results of this season's icebreaking activities. So that'll be an interesting program on April 15th at 11.30 a.m. Central. And here's a list of links to learn more about uh, both the LSMMA, or excuse me, our supporting association and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers website. And there's also a number of Facebook pages for all of us and the YouTube link, which will bring you to our recorded program. So if you missed a portion of today's program or if you want to revisit any of our previous programs, you can find them on this link. 
and also to join our program email list and be informed of future programs, uh, send an email to hello lsmvc at gmail.com. And we also have a few minute survey that uh, will help us improve our programs. If you have a couple minutes now to take that survey, um, we'll put the link in the in the chat so you have easy access to that. Um, yeah, and so we, if you guys want to think of any questions, you can put them in the chat and we will go back to Trisha and have her answer these questions. Trisha, what is your favorite season? Actually, um, I really enjoy summer just because it has the most outdoor uh, recreation things that I can do. I'm a huge fan of camping. Um, I grew up doing that. I love mountain biking, stand up paddle boarding, um, and just I love generally like the sun. <laughs> so being in summer allows to obviously get more of that, more of that vitamin, uh, vitamin D, which is nice. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's my favorite, I would say. This is exciting though, because this year spring is coming earlier for us here in Duluth, so we get a little more warmth than usual. So that's getting me excited for summer as well. Great. Another question came in. Do you know how climate change will affect season changes in northeast Minnesota? I've heard that we'll have shorter springs and falls. Uh, yes, that is correct, actually. Um, and the reason for that is shorter. The, the changing of the seasons won't be as slow as it used to be. I think in previous years, we've noticed that fall comes earlier and it shows signs a lot quicker. So you'll have like two or three weeks with the deciduous trees having their leaves and then dropping them. Um, that's because things like winter are going to get more mild over time. So as the earth uh, warms up, places like Duluth will get more mild. It'll probably turn into, I don't know, like 40, 30 to 40 degrees versus, you know, negative 20. Um, and in other parts of the United States, like you've seen probably in Arizona, there has been things like increase in temperature where there, their stop signs are melting because it gets so hot in the summertime or drought is becoming an issue. So through all those different areas, they're going to have different phono phono phonology, phono phonological uh, responses. <laughs> um, and I think here in our climate, it will be more of shoulder seasons being really quick to have that quick change um, for the seasons that are going to be end up being more mild. I hope that answers your question. Yes, you're welcome, Scott. All right, we still have a few minutes. If anyone thinks of any questions that they'd like to submit through the chat, we'll stick around for a few minutes and see what you come up with. Okay. Someone asked, does flower and leaf pressing also count as a way to do phonology at home? <laughs> Um, yes, that I think that would count just because you're taking, you know, a, a flower and you're probably keeping it to either document it or uh, look at details of it or things like that. Um, and I would say that you being able to put the thought into looking at the details and identifying it is a way to watch the phonology because like, why does that flower bloom in that season or when does it typically bloom? When is it at its peak? I will say, though, that um, we shouldn't pluck too many flowers because that helps our pollinators and they need something to pollinate. So if you're going to do something like that, make sure there's a good population around it. Um, but, yeah, I would say that that's a form of nature connection slash uh, phenology research. That would be good to do with your kids. All right, we'll just wait another minute or two for any other last minute questions. Should we con be concerned if we don't see certain phenological changes um, at certain times throughout the year or do we just be patient and wait for them to happen? Mm. Um, I think that if you're not seeing a typical phenological change, like 
let's say the leaves aren't turning as they should. Normally they turn in September and they're turning in November. Like that would be something worth noting. And if it happens consistently from year to year, then it would be alarming because then that's saying, oh, our shoulder seasons are longer. I mean, that's not the case, but our shoulder seasons are longer. What does that mean for our winters? So I think over time it would have an impact. Um, as far as other events like, uh, let's say, bird migration, if you're counting birds in spring and then a bird species suddenly doesn't appear, I would say that's alarming because <laughs> it's like, what happened to that species? Where did they go? You know, what affected them? So I think to answer your question, it kind of depends. Um, but paying attention to the signs and comparing them from year to year and or from what's normal and what's not would be a good indicator of how high your alarm should be. All right, well, I don't see any questions, any other questions coming in. So I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, taking the time today to participate in the presentation and for all your participation in the chat. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week for, or excuse me, not next week, but April 15th for our next presentation. And until then, everyone stay safe and have a great Easter holiday. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.